All right, I'm going to pin you all. Well, I'll pin myself and Crystal first, and then I'll add you all. As we enter into the conversation, I'm going to let in our, our guests so that we can get started, because I know y'all got places to be. Y'all are all very busy people. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you all. So, or no, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we have people joining us from all across the world today, and I want to honor everybody's time zone. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming out and joining us on this beautiful Saturday, whatever time of day it is where you are located. My name is Shandrea Murphy Washington. I am the co-founder of Sankofa Community Strategies. We are a strategic consulting organization or a strategic consulting agency that uses history and healing to activate communities of color to become agents of change and co-creators within their for their own progress. Today, I am hosting what is our first installment of our new initiative, What's the Issue? What's the Issue is intended to be a platform where community members and experts can come together and have conversations about different issues and, race and barriers that are uh, hindering our racial progress within the state of Arkansas and beyond. Today's issue is Black women's reproductive health. And I'm so excited to have with me a group of phenomenal women who are experts in their fields and in their experiences. So without further ado, I want to pass the mic to my soul sister, Crystal Mercer, aka CC Mercer too, so that she can share some words of wisdom about her womb. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that warm welcome to everybody and also giving me the space to talk about something that has been uh, challenging and triumphant for me over the years. I have a couple of poems that I want to share with the ladies in this space and spaces beyond and in honor of where we are and talking about the first piece is called Fertility. My eggs still drop, but ain't I a woman if nothing hatches? I bat my lashes to push back the tears, they fall anyway, recounting every baby that passed. But ain't I a mother if I miscarried my children? It's confusing. Can't celebrate the woman who made me when she rejects me. Can't celebrate the mother I am when my babies are dead. But I ain't standing over no graves. I have to be kinder to my eggs. One day I looked in the mirror and asked, have you told your body today that she will bear a child? My answer was no, but from that day forward, I tell myself, you will give birth. Your babies will be healthy. Your love for them will mend every open wound. I say it and I mean it, but if babies never come, ain't I a woman if my dreams don't come true? I'm not in a celebrating mood, but my eggs still drop every other cycle of the moon. My hope still hangs in her fertile crescent, my face still reflecting full, even in her waxing and waning. I weep for my babies, but ain't I a mother too? Thank you all <clears throat> so much for listening to that piece and the last piece that I want to share with you just to ground in the space, like things that we don't get an opportunity to talk about out loud or share with each other. Uh, I was having a real bad episode with my endometriosis and I felt like my body was going to explode from the inside out. And I said this out loud and an elder walked past and she said, don't say that. She can hear you say something nice to your uterus. So then I wrote this poem and it's called that time, a letter to my womb. You twist and tangle and expand and contract to remind me that I am woman. I love you, even when it hurts to love you. The babies we've lost can't find them, can't find the right man worthy of entering your walls, the crevices, the crawl spaces that lead to the knowledge of all. But we don't look for him, we just look to each other. 
I hold you at night dreaming about Mercy Pearl, rubbing cramps into dreams preferred, speaking softly, speaking sweetly. I tell you, I love you, I mean it. You are my world. Together we've made new worlds. We've made men come, made babies. I'm sure they were beautiful, even though they didn't survive. We did. We survived the knife. Our first surgery at 22, our last at 39. Hopefully no one will ever have to cut you open again to remove tumors or cancers or babies. Let's keep the babies. Let's not miscarry them. Let's carry them carefully. I'll stay off my feet if you hold them near until it's time to crown the next future king or queen of blackness. Let us teach them that their bodies are sacred, like a temple with texts that only they would understand. Let us teach them that their spaces are holy, they are divine. Even though that old pervert defiled our temple one time when we were 15, he is a rapist. You are a goddess, my goddess. I love you, prayed you back into a healthy space. You deserve it. And even on this day, when you mourn phantom pains, pulling at your basket of eggs, gnawing on your tubes, scraping at the half of cervix you have left, I feel you, we're hurting, but let us be healed. Every day I tell you, I love you, I mean it, you are my world. I pray for your wholeness and our oneness. You remind me that I am woman. If I am woman, you are the universe, black and deep. Your eggs are the stars that litter and glitter the sky. The sun rises and sets on your glory, dearest womb. Work through this pain. I promise we'll make it. I love you even when it hurts to love you. Thank you all so much for giving me the space to share these words with you. And I look forward to what we'll share together. Chandrea, back to you. Whew. I just want to sit with that for a second. That's one thing we don't get to do, you know? We don't often have the time or the space to be vulnerable and sit with what we're feeling. So I wanna sit with those powerful words just for a few seconds. Thank you so much, Crystal. Like you, you, I've told you several times how much of an inspiration you have been to me on my journey as a poet, as my journey to learning my ancestry, learning who I am, learning to love my body and love my womanness. <laughs> and I'm so grateful and honored forever to have people like you in my life and to just ground us in this space with that beauty and that power. So thank you so much again for that. You are so welcome. Thank you for giving me the space and thank you all in the comments so much as well. So next, I'm trying to figure out how to remove this spell. There we go. <laughs> next, um, before we get into the presentation by my sister friend, Dr. Nadia, <laughs> I just wanted to set the context of today's event depending on where you're looking at on Google, Arkansas can be ranked anywhere from third to fifth in the nation when it comes to maternal mortality. And in 2020, I was almost in that number. In 2019, I got pregnant with my, with my son, my last child, the, the king of our house, <laughs> self-proclaimed, of course. And I thought I did everything right. I started with a black OBGYN. Um, I later, maybe like a month or two later, decided that I, this might be my only opportunity to have a home birth. So I switched to a midwife in our community. And in Arkansas, we don't have any black midwives here. We have 
doulas, but we don't have Black midwives. And one of our speakers who was unable to make it today, Nicole Fletcher, she will soon be the first Black certified midwife in the state of Arkansas. So I was excited to have her today. She has something to come up, but like I just want to still ring her praises for being the first and for doing the work so that Black women can have access to that service here. But like I said, I thought I did everything right, you know, had a great pregnancy. Blood pressure was great throughout my pregnancy and had a beautiful birth at home right next to my bed. He didn't want to come out in the water, but he came out on the stool. <laughs> He's stubborn. He came out how he wanted to come out. And it was such a beautiful experience. It was just me, my husband and our midwives and the perfect conditions, no stress, you know, and three days later, after their beautiful birth, my blood pressure shot up to 220 over 110. I hadn't been eating anything wrong. I hadn't, I had only been taking care of my baby. And I just remember going into the hospital and thinking like, okay, they're just going to give me some blood pressure medicine and I'm get to go home and take care of my kid. And when that lady came and put her hand on my shoulder and said, you have to stay here and we don't know when you're going to get home. We don't know when you'll be able to see your family again. Not only did that break my heart, <laughs> but I felt in that moment even more traumatized than when I went in there and saw that my blood pressure was that high because I didn't know if I ever make it home to see my child. And this was my husband's first baby. So he he didn't he didn't know what to do with a newborn with a three day old. And it was the scariest thing that I ever experienced. But a year before that, I lost my sister to ovarian cancer in 2019. And this was after watching her struggle with endometriosis throughout years of her life. Since she was, I want to say, a teenager, she had dealt with those issues. And then a year before that, our oldest sister was in the hospital with high blood pressure after giving birth to her daughter under a medically induced coma for weeks for issues we couldn't understand. Missing out on time with our children, bonding with our new babies for things we couldn't understand not knowing if we would live through that and not knowing if the effects of those moments were going to bleed out into future years, constantly feeling on edge and trying not to let myself get too stressed out because I didn't want to die. And I didn't know how long those effects were going to last. So I'm just so honored to have been able to cultivate this kind of space where we can come together and Talk about what's causing these things. What what can we do? Where do where do these things start? You know. So, I just wanted to give us this space, and now I'm gonna pass the mic to my sister friend, Dr. Nadia, who is like everything in the field of menstruation. <laughs> when I when I learned about her work and had the opportunity to not just hear but see visually what Black girls developing bodies are going through as they prepare for menstruation. And not only that, but learning about the cultural context in which she grew up and learning how it's actual labor, there is work into preparing young girls for girlhood and menstruation. And considering those aren't conversations that we really have here in Arkansas or the South at large, I really wanted to introduce us to that narrative. So I'm going to pass to Dr. Nadia. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for that introduction. So as you've heard, my name is Dr. Nadia Nwube, and I have a PhD from the University of Cape Town. And I want to talk a little bit today about what led me to pursue this PhD. So it was about 2015, um, I was fresh out of graduate school and I was searching for a job. And it came to my attention through my great grandmother um, that, sorry, my great aunt, that there were girls from our home village that were missing school 
So I am Zimbabwean. I'm also in Debele Women, which is a, an ethnic group, a minority ethnic group in Zimbabwe. And we found out, and so she shared with me that there were girls that were missing school because they didn't have access to sanitary wear. And I was gutted hearing this. I mean, menstruation can be complicated as it's already complicated enough when we have the access to all that we need, be it sanitary wear, be it the painkillers for, for difficult abdominal pain um, and, and all the other things that we may require. And so I knew that we needed to do something. And that was the birth of Save the Girl Child movement, which became a, a nonprofit that I run in Zimbabwe and have run since 2015. Um, I highlight the importance of, of menstruation because it is an important doorway into the corridor of reproductive life. Um, we have, you know, there are certain award-winning books, the likes of No Violet Bulawayo's We Need New Names and Bernadine Evaristo's Girl, Woman, Other that speak about the fact that shortly after menstruation, girls become very vulnerable, not just vulnerable to um, the fact that they're capable of, of reproduction, but actually that there can be sexual, childhood sexual abuse that happens at that time. And in these books, we find this trope. And yet the statistics show us that in, um, in Zimbabwe, the 2015 National Adolescent Fertility Study found that 26% of girls aged between 10 to 14 were not confident enough to refuse any sex or sexual touch that they did not want. These figures are really chilling because they are a mirror of what's actually going on in the United States as well. The National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black community found that one in 24 one in four black girls will be sexually abused before the age of 18. And so it's important that at this time that we prepare girls for menstruation, we prepare them for the broader implications of what menstruation means. It's not just about giving them access to the sanitary wear, but it's also helping them to understand what this rite of passage means, the fact that they are now reproductively capable and empowering them to be able to say no to touches that they don't want. Um, in 2016, it was shocking that the Minister of Primary and Secondary Education in Zimbabwe highlighted that 18.8% of girls who had written their seventh grade examinations would be dropping out of school and not transitioning to high school. And so the expected age of a seventh grader in Zimbabwe is 12 years old. That's, that's a problem we aren't having enough of a public discourse about why this is happening. Who is marrying our girls? Who is impregnating our girls at the age of 12 years old? Um, and this is why this space is so important. In Save the Girl Child Movement, what we want to espouse is intergenerational dialogue about social issues. And when we prepare girls about menstruation, we get together three generations. We bring together grandmothers, mothers, and daughters, and they all discuss their experiences of the first period. They talk about what they wish that they would have known and what they would like to impart on younger generations. And the younger generations too get to speak to the fact that were they, uh, did they actually know what was happening to their bodies when they reached the first period? Across many studies, we find that menstruation is only really spoken about in detail after the first period. And so it's my passion that we would have these kinds of dialogues as we're doing here and sharing these experiences so that it's not something that girls stumble into and find out only at the first period and only learn more as they go along, that we would prepare girls from the onset, even before they start menstruating, tell them what menstruation is and, and what it means for them. And we protect our girls from sexual reproductive, sorry, childhood sexual abuse. I wanted to show uh, an infographic as, as per Chandra's kind request. Um, there is part of this narrative and the silence around Black pain and reproduction is because we don't see black bodies as normal. The white body is taken as the standard and we find this even with the representation of Tanner's black 
sorry, Tanner's five stages of, of pubertal development. And so when I was doing my PhD, I wanted to illustrate pubertal development. And I was looking for an infographic that could show that. And I couldn't find any on girls of color. And so I thought that, that would be an opportunity to make an original contribution by depicting that. And so today I wanna show you this infographic because I think it's an important tool that we could use to show, to have these conversations, to put in this reproductive labor work and have these discussions with our daughters and other girls, the girl child that we want to lift up and protect from childhood sexual abuse. I'm just going to share this. And so you see the transitions that are gone through from about the age of eight or so, because um, a lot of black girls have their period at quite an early age, even before teenhood. Um, and so it shows the prebirthal development, pubertal development, and so on. Even the hair loss that does take place with a lot of the grandmothers that were in the study that I did for my PhD had actually lost their hair. And so I thought it was a, an important nod to them, you know, to them that actually it is normal to, to start folding uh, and so on at, at an older age. So I leave you with this infographic and I thank you for allowing me to share this with you folks. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you might want uh, in the Q&A section about the infographic and everything else. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Nadia. Because, like I said, we don't we don't typically have those conversations about you know what menstruation means for our girls. And I can just pull it from my own experience. I can remember not having a conversation about my period until after my period had already happened. And not only that, <clears throat> but because my mom dealt with mental health issues, it wasn't until my first period was over that I actually got the opportunity to sit down with someone and learn how to use a pad, learn what the different methods for, you know, blood collection and, you know, that whole part. I, I didn't know anything. And having a daughter, you know, who is deaf was definitely going to enter into that own phase for herself. I did, I felt like I did the best I could with the limited knowledge that I had and had conversations, you know, beforehand, made sure she had like the little period packs, the just in case packs that you give your little girls when they're going to school, just in case they start their periods earlier. And I still feel like, you know, I wasn't able to really have a holistic and comprehensive conversation with my child just because I didn't learn, my mother didn't learn, my grandmother didn't learn. And I can remember having conversations with my grandmother about how when she started, like her mom made fun, her mom and her older sisters like made fun of her for not knowing what to do. This was back in like the 1950s, but you know, like this generational gap of knowledge that that we've existed in and so it was really important to me to have you here to explain that context around that and um moving further into that i want to bring linda into the conversation here too because linda um before before we went live was speaking to you know more of this cultural context of growing up in zimbabwe and the taboo surrounding menstruation and how that has how that has how that has effects not just you know during during puberty but as you move later into life and even what that looks like in the uk Hi, thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be in this space. Um, I guess I have that advantage, I guess I call of um, growing in a different culture um, and coming to the UK at age 20, but experiencing a whole adulthood as well, if I can call it that in a profession as a midwife in the UK and just seeing how similar the experiences are for black women across the world really um 
and as you've said, Chandra, already, um, I, I started my periods late, I feel, when I speak to people, it's like, I started at 14, which is, I felt was a bit unusual, but even at that much later age, I still hadn't heard about periods at all um, till the first one started. And you will not believe that the first conversation I had about periods was not from an aunt, was not from a mum. At the time I lived with my dad and my stepmom, but it was from the um, house help that we had. She's the one who then said, these are pads, this is how you wear them. But at the time, you know, it was a big bale of cotton wool. So you could buy from the pharmacy a big, big bale of cotton wool. It would last you for ages. Um, but as you know, cotton wool in its raw state, it, it leaves fluff and all of that. And that can lead to other problems, um, especially if the person that's then passing on knowledge to is doing something they've always done, but not thinking of what are the implications, um, even around just wearing. So I used to wear it on the outside, but I know she used to boil up the cotton wool with all its fluff and everything and wear it as, a, as you'd wear a tampon which for reproductive health is not the thing. Um, and as I shared earlier, I, I, I then went through a good 20 years, not knowing that the periods I had were not normal. And I was constantly in a state of being anemic and just never had that, those conversations with everything, anybody. I became a midwife in my early twenties and even with that, I'm a midwife. Once we meet in our profession, we, we are meeting women who are no longer having periods. So those conversations just never ever happened till a cousin came to live with me for a while. And she was like, why do you set an alarm to get up in the middle of the night? And this is what I used to do. I'll set an alarm so that a couple of hours I'd get up um, and not oversleep because the oversleeping meant it led to me making a big mess on the bed and so on. Um, and it's only then we then through just relating our stories, I was like, no, how, what do you mean you wear one tampon the whole day? And then just through few investigations, not few, <laughs> quite many, I then realized I had these fibroids. I've since then had five ops to deal with that. But unless somebody really brings that to life for you, you can go through life um, just not knowing or not even seeking the appropriate help till it's way down the line or till you've suffered a poor quality of life. And that's what I describe it as. Um, being constantly anemic, I couldn't run, I couldn't, all the things I enjoy now I'm an avid runner, I run marathons, but I couldn't do that before. I couldn't even run 5K because my hemoglobin was always in my, somewhere by my, the base of my feet. Um, so it's really important that, um, and one, the conversations I have now quite regularly with people is around just ensuring that they seek the help, they um, talk freely, seek second opinions, but have a space where we can just share different stories and help each other out. Because the things I'm imparting to younger women now is if you have these problems, there's so many ways you can, for example, if it is that you want children, freeze your eggs. When things get better at some point in your late 40s, if you're still in good health, early 50s, I look after women, late 40s, early 50s, who are having babies now and maybe using donor eggs and so on, but there's no reason in 2022, you can't be using the eggs that you froze when you were in early thirties. And with that, you've then got a better chance of having a healthier baby, if I can put it that. I mean, this opens so many minefields, but I'll stop there because I don't want to take over the whole conversation. But um, it, it is about how do we get to a point where it's not taboo and we're free to talk about these things? Thank you so much for sharing that perspective because we definitely 
<laughs> we definitely need to hear that. And as Crystal mentioned in the chat, this sharing space is so important because oftentimes we feel like we're going through these issues alone and that we're the only people who are experiencing what we're experiencing. So to have a space where we could come together and share like the similarities within our stories, whether it be from the lack of knowledge about menstruation or the amount of surgeries we've had to encounter due to endometriosis and fibroids and I, I'm just I'm just loving all of this this vulnerability and just everything that's being cultivated in this space right now. And now I wanted to bring in Dr. Zenobia Harris. She is the executive director of the Arkansas Birthing Project. And I wanted to first ask if you had anything that you wanted to add on about um, the conversation so far as in regards to menstruation, but also learning about your experience with the women that you come into contact with. I know the Arkansas Birthing Project has a plethora of educational content and courses that they teach to uh, birthers across the state. And I just want to know um, how, how women are entering into, into your practice and into your experience. Well, thank you very much for this, this forum today, Shandria. Uh, this was a, an amazing opportunity. And I certainly hope that uh, it'll lead to future uh, forums like this for us to be real frank and honest and share and, and hopefully uh, increase our knowledge and increase our opportunity to uh, encourage and be supportive to women uh, all over the diaspora. Um, I am a public health nurse by training and um, left the public health service a few years ago and became uh, full-time involved with the Arkansas Birthing Project, which is a mentoring program for pregnant women. Uh, we work with local community women in Arkansas um, to train them to provide support to women during their pregnancy and for the first year of life of their babies. But ultimately what we end up doing is creating a, a other a sister friends, um, other people who are part of our families, who provide additional support to us as we navigate becoming parents, becoming um, just going through some of the trials and tribulations that you go through as you uh, give birth. Um, I, it, I, it would be difficult to encapsulate into a brief conversation all the various things that we encounter, but uh, all of you all have talked about so many truths today regarding, um, I think, the, the sanctity of um, the, the work that we are involved in, the, the, the things that we, who we are as women, as women of color, um, and how often our dignity is not respected and listen to, it's not, um, we don't get reciprocal kinds of um, respect when we go into some of the medical spaces we go into seeking care. Um, and, and one particular thing that, a recent example for me was um, a young sister that I um, am, I'm her sister friend, uh, she's, she's 16, she has two children. She has a one-year-old and she has a four-month-old. And um, she has had some pretty, pretty difficult situations to navigate through and really, really is appreciative of, of the extra support she receives and has a great deal of understanding and depth uh, considering her, her, her youth. And I think her situation is not very unusual, unfortunately. Um, I think there are many young women in our communities who need extra support. They need extra, um, not necessarily guidance, but certainly I think someone to help them realize their futures because many of them don't have the opportunity to dream. They're caught up in situations where they don't have the opportunity to dream for themselves and their children. And so, um, that's what we find ourselves in the birthing project, I think, providing that opportunity to talk about the future, to talk about not only their own personal future, but the future of their children as well. And I think that's extremely important as well and extremely um, uh, important responsibility that we have as women and women of color. Uh, 
But the other thing I think we have is, an, uh, I think we have a responsibility and opportunity to serve our sisters in our communities by uh, sharing um, the, the bonuses that we have, have available to us. And also just the opportunity, I think, to uh, grab somebody by the hand and just help them through some difficult situations uh, when they don't seem they don't have the resources available to them for many many reasons. There are many many reasons um, why they don't. So I think I, I, I want to thank you again for Sankofa and what you're doing, uh, Sandria. I want to thank everyone here today for uh, being willing to talk about uh, the the situation that we women experience when we talk about our difficulties with childbirth because of endometriosis and excessive bleeding, uh, the whole phenomenon around uh, period poverty, uh, all the concerns that we have in dealing with our, our menstruation cycles and uh, not even really have a lot of information about menstruation until it actually uh, is upon us. I, I remember my own personal experience. I learned about menstruation from my uh, cousin who was like three years older than me. And it's because she started menstruating and she was using the uh, period products. And I asked her questions about, it. I was seven years old and she was very frank with me and told me uh, what to expect. And I think that, that I mean, people thought I was too young but I think it really prepared me for that. And I think that's unusual. I don't think many young women have that opportunity to be that prepared for menstruation. And even then when it does happen, it's still a shock. To see that happen, to, to, to experience it, as you as you know, I see some of you nodding, to to look and see blood coming out of your body, and you know it's you you talk about it. But it's one thing to talk about; it's another to experience it. So I think uh, we've got to continue to work on normalizing menstruation, normalizing discussions about it, uh, creating atmospheres for it to be easier to talk about these issues to talk about uh, fibroids, to talk about uh, endometriosis, to talk about how that affects our fertility, to talk about how that makes us feel as women, and to talk about how we can support each other through all these various things we have to deal with in the spaces that unfortunately we have to go into to get support and help in the communities we live in, everywhere across this, across this world. So thank you all so much for what you're doing, and thank you all so much for being our sisters. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Harris. That was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and um, I just, I wanted to ask, um, Nadia had mentioned kind of what in, in Zimbabwe's context, how girls were dropping out of school at 12 to either get married or because they were pregnant. And in your story, you mentioned uh, the 16 year old who has, who has two children, not even that far apart. And I wanted to know, what are some of the conditions that our young mothers and birthers are finding themselves in that are that are that are leading to that? Like, what do you think in our in in Arkansas or whether whether we're living in a rural or like the urban part? Because our urban really isn't even that that urban here in Arkansas. So, but like, what kind of conditions are people finding themselves in to where? you can be a 16 year old with your second child? Well, you know, I, 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 you certainly can't generalize, but unfortunately I think this has been repeated. This story is repeated many times over in rural and urban communities where young women find themselves being very vulnerable. I think girls who don't have parents available to them are very vulnerable when they don't have anyone looking out for them. And what I have found is, in my experience, young women who, for various reasons, for example, their parents are on drugs, drug addicted, uh, have other issues, mental health issues, unable to care for them financially, and leave them with people who are not relatives and who don't have concern for them, that, that sets them up, unfortunately, to be taken advantage of sexually. I've seen that many, many times. Um, and it's not necessarily that something that was planned. It just the way that things evolve with those with the, with with their caretakers. So they are they feel vulnerable. Some of them are angry and are looking for validation of their who they are as a person. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, predators can take advantage of these situations. 
And I think we need to start talking more about that too, because there are a lot of predators in our community who are taking advantage of our little girls, our young girls. We need to talk about that. And we need to stop allowing that to be a normal thing. Most definitely. And not only that, but the victim shaming that happens when our little girls are preyed upon by these people within their communities and even within their own family sometimes, you know, the problem is always all of you shouldn't be over there twerking or how short are your shorts or what are you wearing or what were you doing, you know, the believability of our Black girls is such a huge problem and just the adultifying of them and believing that because they may be developed, you know, like they may have breasts, we we have breasts, we have hips, like we, we are are people with figures you know and our bodies are just our bodies you know we this we can't do anything about how we grow so to put the blame on a child for growing you know and not ever calling in the question you know the the uncles that always want to hug or for the kids to come sit on their lap or like the other folks in the communities like riding by the schools trying to pick up the young girls and everything if we already know that we have people in precarious situations why aren't we having conversations about how we can protect them and what we need to be on the lookout for absolutely absolutely Shandri. i think you put the hell on there i think that historically particularly in the United States, as you know, there's a historical context about um, uh, adultifying uh, children of color or much earlier than, than they really, you know, than they really are. I mean, that's a real historical context that we have in this country and it's something we've got to deal with um, as a community. I think we need to have more conversation about it. And I think we need to uh, take more effective action uh, on that situation uh, because our children are poor, important, they are our future and they deserve our protection. Most definitely. I want to bring um, in, bring back in Dr. Nadia and Linda into this conversation as well, because I want to know, because um, this adultification of young girls is happening everywhere. Like if you can be 12 and a man in Zimbabwe is like, all right, it's time for us to get married. Like that's clearly, that that's a problem across the diaspora, across Western, Eastern, whatever culture. How is this showing up in work that not just that you do in Zimbabwe, but also in your practice, Linda, in uh, as a midwife in the UK? How is this adultification still the not just the adultification but the the believability of black girls and women extends far beyond just you know how how they're perceived by predators but also how we how we are received by people who are supposed to care for us so could you all speak to to that experience this the more international lens of what that looks like um i guess i could go first like the what we're finding is that, you know, it's more in the in the literature that's creating these narratives and illuminating these problems. We have a lot of advocacy work that's happening in Zimbabwe around child child marriage. And it's it's tricky because there is um, sort of tension between customary law and civil law, right? Because up until about 2016, even in terms of civil marriages, girls that were um, age 16 could be married without um, the consent of the parents. It's only during um, a kind of precedent a precedent was set that from 2016 a girl had to be a minimum age of 18 years to be in a civil marriage um, and in Zimbabwe it's important to note that there is two types of marriage as I'm mentioning there's customary marriage which is the traditional marriage for which a bride price is paid to the parents of um, the bride and then we also have civil marriage which is one where you would go to the court and you would sign a legal document and and get a marriage certificate and so we have 
tension between those who see that child marriage is a problem and are trying to speak up against it and don't want girls to be married um, before the age of 18. And then you have the chieftaincies because there's still, it's still a very patriarchal society. And there's also um, chiefs who are part of the sort of legal structures and the way that decision making is made around marriage. And they are saying, and they still have this belief that, you know what, that you cannot be a, a, a child child and be married there's almost this um this paradox in in vernacular even when we speak in isindevele or shona you're not able to capture this expression of child marriage because essentially when somebody is a a, a mother or a wife they are that and there isn't the element of, of it being still an extension of childhood or someone being an adolescent and too young at the time so I think we need to carry on advocating, even though there is pushback from the um, the chieftaincies themselves. We've seen a, a real development happening with um, the new marriages bill that consolidates both customary marriage and civil marriage under one act, and it has created the the minimum age of for eight the minimum age of 18 for every type of marriage. So I'm hoping to see an improvement that passed through parliament in March of 2022. And it took about three years for it to actually pass because there was a lot of objection from, from the chiefs and, and, and the sort of traditional sector in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Wow. I don't know if Linda wants to give it a go. <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Nadia. I, I think um, just being in the space today, it's good for me to, I'm a, you know, a bit embarrassed to say, really catch up with what's happening on the Zimbabwean scene around um, uh, what's happening with young girls. Um, and, you know, it, it focuses the mind to say, you know, maybe you need to do a little bit more in that space. Um, but over the years I've worked here as a midwife in the UK, um, what that translates to not having a voice for you or not having those spaces where you're able to articulate exactly what's going on and having people that stand up for you and advocate for you, is it then translates to this whole um, where um, black women coming through the maternity system or through their maternity journey, very much experiencing that if healthcare professionals, even black healthcare professionals, do not listen to them. Do not listen. Um, if we are, uh, if you do speak up, you're seen as angry or aggressive. Um, and that translates to, I mean, the stats in the UK are very similar, I would think, um, to the US, but the stats in the UK are that um, if you're black or brown, so black, you're four times more likely to die than white counterparts um, during your maternity journey, either in pregnancy or soon after. Um, if you're Asian, you're three times more likely um, and those are stark figures to look at and listen to. Morbidity rates are higher. Um, um, uh, mortality rates amongst the babies as well are higher. Um, black women likely to have a child that then goes into a &E type um, soon after the week, soon after birth and so on. So the question has been asked for many years to say, but how is this? How have we got into this situation? Because it's not just um, immigrants as it affects, it will be first generation black women as well. And it's like, but we've been saying for many years that you are not listening. I mean, there's other things that come into this narrative. But I think the heartbreaking thing for me, um, in the job that I do now, I see a lot of women who are complaining about the services we give or have had a bad experience. Um, had a, had a bad experience, but it's good to, to always reiterate, I guess, that childbirth, um, having a baby, whether it's a vaginal birth or C-section or so on in Europe is really, really safe. But I know too many of those stories for when it does go wrong, it goes really, really wrong. 
And when you look at who it's going wrong for, that's when you get the um, differences in color. And the sad thing is when black women then say, I was mistreated by black doctors, black midwives, you then come to the space where it's really real that hurt people hurt people. Does that make sense? Um, so if as a black woman, you've gone through and had your children in the same system and never had those, that time to heal or time to explore what's causing that, how do you then look for, look after rather, another person in a really compassionate way? How, if you've got these things that are culturally ingrained in you, do you not pass judgment and treat somebody the way somebody treated you however many years ago? It's a really, really difficult space to be in, but we are at the point where we're having those conversations. Um, but whatever you look at, say look at the last couple of years, who's not engaged in the, let's take up the COVID boosters. Um, COVID has a devastating effect on pregnant women especially in the third trimester. These were the women that um, as time went on because COVID um, vaccines weren't rolled out in the same way. There was all this, we haven't tested it on pregnant women. So pregnant women saw it as maybe we shouldn't have the vaccine. When um, the um, hospitalizations, admissions, so being severely sick started going down in the general population, we're still high amongst pregnant women. And that's because they were the least vaccinated group. And that came from all the stories from before. So not having these conversations in the right context and doing things around that then translates into other things that then come as problems in the maternity sphere. Thank you so much for sharing that because here we often we, we're dealing with so many of our own maternal health issues here that it's hard for us to kind of see the similarities of how even in the UK, you know, there's still this disparity of Black women not having easy access to the health care that they need. And this, the discrimination didn't didn't end, you know, at the Atlantic Ocean. It crossed it crossed with us. So, wow, <laughs> just wow. Um, Dr. Harris, I wanted to ask you with um, the new abortion bans that have been going into effect, how has that changed the nature of the work that you're doing? Or like, how ha have you had to change how you're advising women and birthers on birth control, their access to healthcare physicians? Like what, what is changing for you in this landscape? That's a great question, Chandri, and I think it affects all of us in this community uh, in many ways. But um, what, what I haven't personally, since the ban, we haven't personally encountered anyone who has been seeking an abortion or feels like they need an abortion. But I think um, I feel like I have failed a woman if I've been interacting with her, we've been interacting with her, and she gets to a point where she wants an abortion versus we haven't had that that discussion about reproductive health and, and her choices in terms of controlling her fertility as she would like to. So I think the important thing that we do with women is we, we usually encounter them when they're already pregnant and they want additional support during the pregnancy. But part of our conversation with them is also to talk about birth control and their their agency about it. Many women have not even considered or talked about the, the the power that they have to make the decision as to whether or not they want to be pregnant and when they want to be pregnant. And I think that's an important option we need to um, be sure women are aware of and exercise their right and their freedom to make that choice. Um, I do think it's going to become, um, as, as time passes uh, and as we deal with this issue, I think it's going to become um, more of a challenge for us because uh, some of our local uh, abortion resources are um, are no longer available. And um, we're going to have to uh, 
support women going to other states to uh, seek that service if they if that's what they choose to do. Um, but for us, we're more we've been more focused on birthing babies and bringing babies and and healthy moms supporting healthy moms than we have been on the abortion issue. To be honest with you. Thank you for giving us that clarity and thank you for the work that you do here because we don't have the guidance that we need in the mentorship to know how to how to have healthy pregnancies, how to have healthy births and even though like caring for yourself and baby afterwards. And I know y'all have I, just going through your website. I saw like different childbirth classes, parenting classes. Y'all have stuff that y'all do for fathers. Like y'all are doing some amazing work to make sure that parents of color here have the opportunity to be successful. So just thank you again for your work. Well, we feel like we need to speak up for Black women. <laughs> I mean, if we don't do it, who will? <laughs> right. That's right. Um, Dr. Nadia and uh, Linda, how have um, have you? I know that like we our laws like y'all y'all hear about what what goes on here with like how they try to control our reproduction and like how little rights we as women feel that we have when it comes to having our own bodily autonomy here. What are some ways that you all are witnessing that um, in, in the UK, because I know Nadia, you're in Scotland as well. Have you seen, what ways have you seen them try to control, you know, women's access to, access to care, their autonomy over their own bodies? Do you have, do y'all even have the same types of issues when it comes to controlling when and if you get pregnant? Um, hmm. I guess you can't have any of these conversations without really drilling down things like bias and how that comes into just how some somebody's care would be planned um so as i said you know i normally it, it's from the time someone's pregnant that i start to get um uh involvement within their care but it would be the same within the primary sector as well so for a lot of black women in the UK, um, I don't want to generalize, but the things that you tend to see are problematic would be around fibroids, around um, sickle cell disease, um, uh, high blood pressure, and bring with that. I mean, we've come a long, long way, but access is always an issue. So where do people live? What access do they have to preconception care? So if you're living with sickle cell disease, you're the type of person that we would really want you to engage in services before thinking of becoming pregnant. But what are the hindrances around that and getting access to the um, type of expert advice that you need? And you then suddenly get into the space where um, women will repeatedly then tell you that as a sickle cell disease sufferer, you know, every time I come up to a and &E, I'm just seen as somebody who's a junkie on painkillers and just coming to school and not being listened to at all. Um, uh, funny, um, in a couple of weeks, we host, I'm hosting um, or chairing a conference for senior leaders within the NHS. And the theme for that particular one, because it's Black History Month for us in the UK in October, um, which is different from yours. <laughs> I know that um, in terms of month. Um, we decided on this inequalities theme to that particular conference, and it was to try and unpick some of this. Um, but bias comes a lot into it. Um, and as I said previously, repeatedly women say to us, you are not listening. Yeah. So what you'll hear from the political side or is that it's all to do with um, poverty and life chances and all of that. But that can't be the answer to everything. That can't be the fallback position for 
where we find ourselves. Um, and there has to be something within us as healthcare professionals to say enough is enough. How do we, I mean, um, the Five Tongues More campaign is something that came out of two women's experiences through our system um, during childbirth, being pregnant and having a baby in the UK. And they said enough is enough. You've got this Embrace report. So Embrace is a report on maternal mortality. Um, and it gives a report on the mortalities over the last, it's now done as a yearly thing, is that from that, you then, um, the stats were there and these two women then challenged the whole of the UK and said, but what are you doing about it? If as a black woman, I'm five times more likely to die, how do you then assure the next generation of women or the women booked within the services that you are safe within maternity services? Why is it that I should carry the statistic? Am I safe coming in having my baby? I mean, there's been a lot of work improvements that have been done that, you know, that's, that's the, is now four times more, but it's still four times more than your white counterparts. So part of the work that's been done like during COVID was to make us all aware and just have a low threshold for giving that type of care that a black woman needs when she comes in. So I have a lower threshold of admitting somebody, for example, who comes in with COVID symptoms, but part of it infused in that was, you know, just ensuring that people are having the right amounts of vitamin D, um, the right access really, and having translation services. I mean, translation services is a whole ball game on its own. Um, the UK, especially London, is really multicultural. English is not everybody's first language. And if you don't speak the language, if you don't, can't communicate with the people around you, even your neighbours, how do you then know that you can access X, Y, Z within the services? But once you are within maternity services, we as health professionals should ensure that we have that two-way relationship. And that's how healthcare works. You should be part of planning your own care. And you can't do that if we're not making the effort and using Google Translate to put across messages that are really important about your health. We've got interpreting services and we should use them as a tool to aid their care that we give. So all of that was brought in. Um, what I haven't mentioned is the first chief midwife in the whole of the country. Um, is Jackie Dunkey Blent and she's a black woman. So the very first ever chief midwifery officer is black. Um, very inspirational woman, used to be my boss many years ago. Um, but it then puts to somebody like me that oh, anything's possible, yeah. But within that space, as you were asking Shandraya, it's how do we empower every black woman within our spaces, within our communities to be able to speak? So um, part of the work that we did throughout COVID, for example, was when we realized that the numbers weren't as great as they could be, especially amongst black, and it wasn't just black women who were having babies, it was black staff as well. There is this mistrust why are you insisting that we have this vaccine? Start with that. So we were having these conversations within community spaces to really understand where the mistrust comes from. And that could be a whole conference on its own. Most definitely could be. <laughs> there is so much mistrust in our medical system here, especially when it comes to African Americans. When it comes, like whether it's Henrietta Lacks, whether it's the Tuskegee experiment, like we we have a, a vivid history of yeah, mistrust yeah, Shand in our Shandri, I think I think it's important, and I, and I think um, Linda's hit upon some. Uh, I think we have to talk about the impact of institutionalized racism and on the health outcomes of people of color. I mean, that's that's what we're that's really what we're talking about here. Um, and I, it 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 certainly and there's growing body of research that demonstrates that the the impact of racism on the health outcomes of women of color is infinite. Um, it affects 
It affects the way your body grows. It affects the way that you respond to everyday stressors. It affects the way that your body responds to giving birth when you're growing your baby. Any stressors that you're experiencing, the increased levels of cortisol in your body are going to affect the outcome of your baby. You're going to have to outcome your, your pregnancy. It'll affect your blood pressure during the time you're having your baby and after you have the baby. I mean, there are many, many factors that are at work here to, in addition to all the things that we experience with our, with our wounds, with the endometriosis, uh, really uh, fibroids and the really heavy menstrual cycles and the bleeding and the anemia, all these things are rooted in, in some, uh, I, I think some institutionalized um, ways of, of being living that we have experienced over decades, centuries and I, I think we have to call the thing what it is in order to be able to begin to identify what we must do to be able to save our lives and save the lives of our families and our children. Most definitely. Nadia, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I I wanted to add about, you know, the issue of believability. Um, recently got some funding for a podcast that I'll be doing and having guests who like myself have struggled with the pathway to diagnosis and in the UK there's about an 11 there's a nine-year delay in diagnosis to endometriosis and in the US it's as long as 11 years and so this this exactly what, what Dr. Harris is saying about the institutionalized racism, the fact that when we go to these places complaining of, you know, an ailment or pain, you're told, oh, no, periods are just painful. They're just hard. They're difficult. Um, I myself have been trying to, to get diagnosed with endometriosis. And initially they were insisting on doing a, a pelvic sonogram. And we know that a pelvic sonogram actually cannot diagnose um, endometriosis. It'll only pick up if there are structural issues in, in, your, in your uterus, like if you were having um, fibroids or if you had you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome, that's, that would come up on, on um, you know, a pelvic sonogram. And so it, it's, it's a real problem in terms of, of that, the fact that even when you are uh, knowing that there isn't enough uh, black doctors or, or black midwives or black um, you know, medical pr practitioners for us to, to speak to, then you brave up to go and have that conversation with a white, uh, a white uh, medical practitioner and you're told, oh, well, actually I've, I've even heard that, oh no, maybe the cramping that you're experiencing is to do with your bowel. I think at the age of, you know, 32, having had my period since 13, I know the difference between, you know, ab abdominal cramping that's related to my uterus and cramping that is, you know, a, a stomach pain or constipation. And so being undermined as well, when you are trying to seek that help, um, there's even a drop off in terms of that delay, because people will then, you know, lose heart about going and complaining and, and trying to seek that help. So that protracts that delay in diagnosis that already exists with endometriosis and other reproductive complications. Wow, thanks so much for sharing that, Nadia. I had no idea what all you could or couldn't diagnose with a pelvic sonogram. And the, the years of delays, like that is just mind blowing. Nine years in the UK and about 11 years here in the United States. Wow. That is mind-blowing information, just freaking mind-blowing. And it makes me wonder, like, for the health conditions that aren't experienced by predominantly people of color, what are what is their weight for their diagnosis? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's just insane. And even, it, it reminds me... Um, even with the believability about the pain, there was this, there's this video that's been going around on TikTok lately about this woman who was, um, she was about seven months pregnant, experiencing a lot of pain in the hospital. And she had gone to her doctor 
to get a note for, to just ask to take it easy at work. And the nurse was like, well, what did you think when you got pregnant? What did you think was going to happen that you were just going to be able to just sit around and just lay around all day? Like you, we weren't going to have to work. Is that what you thought you were going to have to do? She was like, I worked up until the day I had all of my kids and the black woman laying in the bed was like, yes, you, you did my exam, but like, you don't know what my cramps feel like. You don't know what my body is, what I'm feeling within my body. And like the, the doctor had already come in and cleared the woman. It was going to give her the, uh, give her the letter, but the nurse was upset that this black woman had the audacity to want to take it easy during the last couple of months of her pregnancy as she was experienced in pain. And just the fact that these are the types of people that we have to deal with within our medical institutions who are supposed to be providing us care. Of course, you're, go you're, not, you're gonna be reluctant to complain or speak out about something if you already know that the people that you're interacting with have it out for you or don't care about you or aren't gonna believe your pain anyway. Yes, Chandra, that's, that's, that's one reason that we promote Speak Up for Black Women. When, when you're in these spaces and you see women being treated unfairly, we need to gather up the resource within ourselves to speak out and to identify what we see is happening and advocate on behalf of women, particularly in the birthing space, because often women can't advocate for themselves when they're in labor, when they're in these situations. Uh, we, they need an additional support system, and that's what we try to build with our sister friends. That is amazing because we definitely need that kind of support. And not everybody, like there there has been a large push for more people to get doulas. And I think that is amazing and great. But with the socioeconomic situations that a lot of us find ourselves in, that's not always an option for us. We don't always have an extra $800 to $1,000 that we can pay out of pocket to have that kind of support and advocacy. So having organizations like the Arkansas Birthing Project who connects you to mentors and connects you to people who can advocate for you during that time is so important. And once again, I'm just grateful for the work that you're doing for Black birthers here in the state. Oh, you're, you're muted, Dr. Harris. <laughs> we can't hear you. <laughs> I said, I have to leave the conversation, but thank you all for your work that you're doing and for leading this conversation. And I hope you'll continue to convene uh, meetings like this in the future. I definitely will. We're hoping to do Wonder in Black Maternal Health Week in April of next year. So fingers crossed. <laughs> so thank you for being here, Dr. Harris. For this, uh, for the last portion, I really just wanted to open it up to our people in the audience. I know this has been a full conversation, full of information, and I just wanted to give people the space to either share their own stories of what they have experienced as a Black birther or a Black menstruator. Tell us your stories. Tell us if something that you've heard has really struck you today and you just want to comment on that. I told Bria that I will let her go first because she has been waiting since we started to, <laughs> to participate. But if anybody would like to make a comment, just raise your hand and I'll call on you as you all raise them. Bria, would you like to speak? <laughs> yes, I would, mother. Yes, I would. So like uh, today we were, they were talking about like the average age to get your period and when she said 14, I like my brain could not comprehend that for some odd reason. It's because like me, I have like a group of a lot of black friends, me and all my black friends. One of my friends started hers at like eight. One of them started at seven. I started mine at nine. And the fact that like I'm starting to realize that my body and like my uterus is not like normal and it's not been studied like other people's have been it's just a lot and you know sometimes like I wonder like what especially with all the stuff going on now like it's hard to believe that like I try to like shut that stuff out of my mind but it's hard to believe that like I may actually not be able to like I may struggle 
having a child, like say I decide I want to have a kid and you know, the experience we were talking about with that girl and her doctor was like getting on her about how she wasn't working while she was pregnant. I'm realizing that like that may happen to me, like all of these things that happen to other people, other women of color, it's just like, it's horrifying. It's like terrifying to think that I may actually have to deal with all the stuff going on. Like I try not to think about it, but all the stuff that they're trying to get past, like all these laws they're trying to get past to like stop me from being able to use my body and all the laws that they already have that I can't use my body the way I want to, I'm realizing that's gonna affect me in the future. And I'm gonna have to learn how to live with that. And you were saying like, you know how you're talking about how me and you didn't really get to have like a like advanced conversation about having your period and stuff. I like, I never thought of that because I thought that was like good information because you gave pretty good information, but but then I had to realize it's been two years, mom, and I still do not know how my period works or my body works at all. I have like, I realized like I was talking to my friends, they were like, yeah, I like, listen, I have like white friends. They told me how like, when like some of them are started and some of them haven't and they told me how like some of them like they have the most normal period in existence but like with mine it's like I have like very bad cramps I can't like I run a lot at school because like you know I race and stuff and when I'm on my period I can't do that type of stuff because of the amount of pain that I will feel and it's it shocks me because my friends can do, my friend can play basketball while she's on her. They can do all these different things. And I'm realizing like, I'm abnormal because of the way that our race and like the way that our bodies work. I'm not normal. Like my, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I don't fit the normal expectations of what women's bodies do because I am not the normal the you you know how like people normalize Caucasian people for like the body analyzation I don't fit into that at all and it's I don't know how I feel about that and it's really inspiring to hear people talk about that type of stuff and hear them like it's it's nice to hear all this information and get to know all this new stuff about my body and I've actually- uh, We lost Bria. <laughs> well, I know that she can hear me cause she's just in the room next to me, but <laughs> I was gonna tell her that not to feel like she's not normal because white supremacy has made black women's bodies abnormal. And just because white supremacy has robbed us of the opportunity to exist as full human beings and have access over our bodies and knowledge over our bodies. And she she said it's been two years for her. I'm on year 32 of of not knowing how my period works. So (laughs) I too am thankful for all the information we were able to get today. Um, Jasmine, I have saw your hand raised. Did you still want to say something? Um, yes. Yeah. So I could go on about all this stuff. But one thing that really stuck out to me is the diagnosis, like the 10, 11 year diagnosis time frame. I have a friend and I believe like in 2015, she had a baby, but the baby didn't survive because they were calling it saying her uterus was stubborn. And so for years she has been, you know, she's been diagnosed with endometriosis and, but she felt like something was wrong in her body. So this year she requested an ultrasound and she paid for it. She was like, you know, I'll do whatever because something is not right. So she found out that she had fibroids. But when she went to look at her medical records online, she realized that her 
physicians knew she had the fibroids when she had her baby in 2015. But they You're breaking up, Jasmine. The reason why she knew is oh, because they uh, calculated the growth and they were, her doctor basically told her she should just take, oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Her doctor <laughs> told her basically she should just take Tylenol for it and it just made her, um, it was just going to make her feel uncomfortable. So it just begs the question, how many times do they actually see something wrong and don't say anything to us about it? because they just feel like, oh, it's not really affecting them. It's just making them feel uncomfortable. It's nothing that they can't just live. And now she's thinking that maybe her child would be here, like startling just to know that people are dealing with these types of things and the doctors are just waving it off. Yeah, that is so heartbreaking to hear. And like you said, like they knew she had that when she gave birth and probably prior to that and just never mentioned it. Wow. Wow. I don't see any more hands. So what I want to do now Let's go ahead and wrap up for the evening. I am so, so, so grateful to my two guests that I have left that stay with me to the end. Y'all have been amazing. Thank you so, so, so much for sharing this international kind of context and really helping us all to understand what this issue looks like across across seas, across oceans, across countries, all of this, because it really is important for us to know what we as Black women are experiencing and to know that what's happening to one of us is probably happening to all of us. So I appreciate you so much for joining me here in this space. To all the people who watch it out there in Facebook land or you who are, who are still on the Zoom, if you all registered via Eventbrite, um, and your name is pulled for a prize, you will be receiving an email from me so that I could get the information to send out your prizes. Um, thank you again for being here. Um, Dr. Nadia's organization, Save the Girl Child, the Girl Child Movement, is having a campaign called the Let's Get Padded Up campaign. They are they are collecting donations so that they can supply a uh, period supplies to girls in Zimbabwe. Uh, Dr. Nadia, if you wanted to speak some more on that, please feel free. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Yes, that's quite right, as Chandrea said. Every year we have a Let's Get Padded Up campaign where we mobilize sanitary wear to distribute in Zimbabwe to girls in the rural areas. And we sometimes take some nominations of other needful communities. We're hoping to expand this year because we started providing to some communities in South Africa as well last year. We wanna continue that good work. We want the, the movement to catch fire and keep spreading. So I'll drop the link to our Let's Get Padded up campaign and if you could share that amongst your networks and if you want to feel if you feel called to donate that would be amazing as well thank you all right linda did you have any final words thank you so much for your expertise as a midwife with the what the what is it the the nhs the national health systems i believe i know here we only we only have one hospital that has like certified nurse midwives and you still have to go through the hospital and do everything through there so you don't really get that true midwife experience that you have with more independent midwives here so i think Thank you for bringing your expertise, your cultural lenses, your bicultural lenses that you brought here to this today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea, for um, allowing me to be in this space today and for Nadia, too, for Nadia for reaching out to me. Um, 
I was listening to your story and I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I, there's so many things that are wrong, but there's some things we do have right in the NHS. And one of them is that ability for women to choose where they want their babies. Um, autonomy is a big thing here. Um, and place of birth is a big thing as well. Um, so we have many community midwives, like where I work, there's always somebody on call for home births for the night. Mm. And yeah, many black midwives that are in that space as well. So I was listening to and I was like, oh, how sad. One, one certified midwife. I was like, how can that be? Um, and midwives work in a way that, you know, you can be quite independent and have um, your own practice, really, if that's what you want to do. But working within the NHS, um, there's, uh, well, a whole mountain that we're still climbing really um in terms of just trying to ensure access to women that wouldn't otherwise have that you know because in london in amongst that you'll have refugees mm. um, coming in to london and so on and um ensuring that women get because pregnant is finite pregnancy is finite isn't it you don't have a lot of time to dilly dally or nine years to diagnose somebody Mm -hmm. you know, COVID happened and stopped everything but for pregnancy we had to carry on we couldn't stop cesarean sections and all of that so no thank you so much and just from just being here today I'm like okay I need to look this 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 out but Nadia I'll be in touch because um yeah I need a fundraising um idea so I'll run a couple of marathons <laughs> wonderful <laughs> I can't wait we'll keep in touch <laughs> yeah pledged in public uh, I'm quite the fundraiser if you if I put my mind to it okay look That's at brilliant. us building connections in the zoom <laughs> yeah <laughs> well thank you all again for joining us thank you for speaking and sharing all of this information i also want to give a final special shout out to our sponsors at more chances period they are an organization that fights period poverty across the state of arkansas and i will catch you all at our next installment <laughs> bye thank you.